Hi everyone, it's Katrina, the giant footprint. In 2012, a video appeared online of a giant footprint that was discovered embedded in the rock wall of a cliff in South Africa. Michael Tellinger, a local writer, was responsible for shooting the video near the border of Swaziland. According to Michael, the footprint is an exact match to a human foot, only it's about six feet long. It's also imprinted in rock that's anywhere between 200 million and 3 billion years old. But this is all according to Michael, not any mainstream archaeologist. Michael said the footprint is so amazing that it should be drawing millions of tourists to South Africa every year. Not everyone is convinced, though. Dr. J. Weil said it's almost certainly not a footprint. Another expert named Garth Mitchell agrees that it's likely not a footprint because living beings of immense size didn't exist on the planet three billion years ago. There wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere to sustain that kind of complex life. The footprint is still a hotly debated subject. It does look like the imprint of a giant human's foot, but mainstream scientists have stayed well away from it. No reliable scientists seem interested in studying the footprint. However, it started to draw tourists especially those who believe there was once a race of giants who ruled the world. It isn't that crazy to think there may have been a race of giants. Almost every early civilization in the world had at least one myth of a race of giants that went extinct. There were the Nephilim in the Bible, and the Native Americans had their own legends of red-haired giants who lived in caves. Such tales were told in ancient Greece and Rome. Even the Aztecs believed a race of giants came before them, but were extinguished by a vengeful god. In Peru, the Inca had an almost identical myth, and some even believe giant DNA remains in our bodies. Robert Wadlow was born in February 1918, and he grew to be 8 feet 11.1 inches. Then, born in Scotland in 1825, Angus McCaskill weighed over 500 pounds and had hands about a foot long. He grew naturally to 7 feet 9 inches and had the largest chest circumference of any non-obese man who ever lived. These are just two examples of real giants that lived among us. So, could it be that human beings still have traces of giant DNA in our bodies? Is the giant footprint in South Africa a hoax, as scientists say? Or is it proof of an ancient kingdom of giants? The Discovery of Ether Ether was declared by Aristotle to be the fifth element 2,300 years ago. Medieval alchemists believed ether was the key to unlocking the Philosopher's Stone. Scientists in modern times believed ether was an invisible medium through which light moved across the universe. But the disappointing truth is that ether never existed at all. In 1887, Albert Mickelson went about trying to prove once and for all that ether was a real element. Albert and his colleagues set up the project in the basement of their university in Cleveland, Ohio. They planned to bounce light beams off mirrors in various directions, measuring the speed light traveled. They were hoping to capture light moving at a different velocity so that they could prove the invisible force called ether really existed. But the experiment didn't work, and after 2,000 years, Years, one of the biggest theories that dominated physics fell flat. The theory of ether started with the ancient Greeks. They believed it was a natural element in the universe. It was pure air breathed by the gods in the heavens, superior to the air breathed by mortals on Earth. Plato, when discussing his theory of the universe, said ether was the brightest part of air. Then, in the 4th century BC, Aristotle placed ether alongside Earth, air, fire, and water. He believed it was the fifth terrestrial element. In the 12th century, medieval alchemists believed ether was a special element hidden inside plants and animals. It was a godly essence hidden inside all living things, but it was hard to free. Their theory was that if a substance could be distilled down to its elemental form, its ether could be captured. Then the ether could be used in alchemical rituals to turn boring base metals like lead into gold. But in 1644, French philosopher René Descartes had a new theory of what ether was. He believed it to be the fifth element filling the entire empty vacuum of space. He reasoned that space couldn't possibly be vacant. So it must be filled with an invisible substance called ether, which was necessary for the forces of gravity to work properly. It was believed, until the 18th century, that ether was responsible for moving the planets into orbit. 
The experiment in 1887 brought the belief in ether to an end. The magical fifth element, thought to be as real as fire and water, was found to be nothing but a mere fantasy. And now it's time for a big shout out to Rugged X and Mr. Death. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The Nebraska Man Harold Cook was a geologist in Nebraska in the early part of the 20th century. In 1917, he came across a fossilized tooth that he'd never seen before. Harold believed that the tooth was important, so he sent it to the American Museum of Natural History. After examination, the president of the museum, Henry Osborne, claimed that the tooth belonged to an anthropoid. Then, after discussing the tooth with another scientist at the museum, they all came to an agreement. The tooth found by Harold came from a higher primate. The scientists believed the tooth was an upper molar from a unique type of ape that had never been described before. It was such an exciting discovery that every scientist in the world was following it closely. Osborne named the new creature after Harold Cook, calling it Hesperopithecus Harold Cookei. Everyone agreed the ape was the first of its kind to ever be found in North America, and that it lived during the Pliocene epoch between 5.3 million and 2.6 million years ago. This caused a big stir in the scientific community. Never before had someone found evidence of an ape-like creature in North America. Osborne was so convinced of himself that he made replicas of the tooth and sent them to scientists across the globe. Most agreed it was the tooth of a new ape, one that would change the history of the planet. British anatomist Grafton Elliot Smith called it groundbreaking. He then collaborated with an artist to create an image of what the creature would have looked like. It was a stretch since they only had a single tooth, but people loved it. The mysterious ape became known as the Nebraska Man, but in reality, it was nothing but a pig. In 1925, scientists went to the location where Harold originally found the tooth. They excavated a massive area but didn't find any ape remains. Instead, they found the skeletal remains of an extinct species of pig. The tooth came from a hog, not a mythical ape. A retraction was then published in Science Magazine in 1927, two years after the fact. The scientists tried to keep the truth a secret so that they weren't humiliated, but the secret got out. Planet Vulcan Einstein's theory of general relativity says gravity isn't a natural force. Instead, Einstein believed gravity to be a result of space-time curving around the presence of huge objects like stars and planets. It was Einstein's theory that planets didn't orbit the sun because of gravity, but because of curving space-time. His view was that the planets are falling toward the sun, not orbiting around it. In 1859, famous French astronomer Urbain Le Verrier became obsessed with the way Mercury orbits the Sun. So, using the fundamental laws of motion that were set down by Sir Isaac Newton, the French astronomer desperately tried to make sense of Mercury's orbit. Unfortunately, though, he couldn't. Mercury is too eccentric. The way it moves around the Sun doesn't follow the laws of gravity in the slightest. So, to make sense of the planet's odd motion, Urbane came up with a logical explanation. He proposed the existence of a mysterious planet between Mercury and the Sun. He believed that this mystery planet likely threw off the gravitational pull of Mercury, which would make sense given its erratic orbit around the Sun. The new planet was named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire. Seeing as Urbane was the mastermind who previously discovered the position of Neptune, a totally new planet, the scientific community was eager to believe him. After all, he found Neptune using nothing but mathematics. He wasn't even able to see it in the sky. Then, in 1846, Vulcan officially became a new planet. In the decades that followed, people continuously claimed that they saw this mysterious planet. Astronomers all over the world desperately positioned their telescopes on the sun. Hoping to get a glimpse of Vulcan passing across its surface, Many believe they saw it, but none could ever definitively prove it. Then, in 1915, Einstein's theory of relativity removed the necessity for the hypothetical planet. Einstein showed that the peculiarities in Mercury's orbit were caused by space-time curvature, not Vulcan. The planet went from being real to being absolutely nothing. Zerzura Zerzura is the name of a beautiful oasis city that was discovered in the sweeping sand desert of the Sahara. 
According to a mysterious Arabic text from the 15th century, Zerzura was located somewhere west of the Nile in Egypt, likely in Libya. It was described as a whitewashed city, meaning it was built from pure white stone. It was also said to be filled with unprecedented riches. Wealth beyond measure was hidden in the palaces and underground vaults of the oasis town. The people of Zerzura had flawless black skin, and the whole place was guarded by massive black giants. It was a fantastic city, but none who saw it were allowed to leave. The old legends say that anyone who entered the city, discovering it deep in the desert by accident, was kept there forcefully by the giants. The origin of Zerzura can be traced to Greek historian Herodotus, who lived between 484 and 425 BC. Herodotus wrote about a mysterious city that was lost in the desert sands of the Sahara. He called it the City of Dionysus, in connection with the Greek god of wine. Then, 2,000 years later, in 1835, John Gardner Wilkinson claimed Zerzura was real. He was a British archaeologist who met Arabs who said they'd been to the oasis city. One man even claimed that he found Zerzura's ruins by accident while searching for a lost camel. He wasn't able to provide a specific location, but John was adamant the city existed. For centuries, Zerzura was a real city somewhere in the desert, but now it's nothing but a myth. In 1932, Hungarian pilot Count Ladislas del Masi discovered a remote oasis in the desert while flying over the area. But a brief search didn't reveal any traces of a city, leading many to think that Zerzura was swallowed up by the desert sand. The Canali Telescopes were a big deal in the 19th century. In the early 1800s, observatories started getting larger and telescopes started getting more sophisticated. Then, by 1877, scientists were looking for life on Mars. One of those scientists was Giovanni Virginio Schiaparelli, the director of the Breda Observatory in Milan. Giovanni started mapping areas on the red planet that he thought existed. For example, he thought he saw oceans and started giving them names. He believed he saw continents, so he named them after mythological sources. His biggest discovery was a group of channels that were cut into the face of the planet, which he called canali, but the word was mistranslated into English as canals. People thought the astronomer had discovered evidence of canals dug by an intelligent race of Martians. The rumor spread across the world, and soon the Martian canals had become a legitimate discovery. In 1894, Boston astronomer Percival Lowell decided that the canals were 100% real. From his private observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, he started mapping hundreds of alien channels. He thought they were built by Martians to carry water from the polar caps to the equatorial regions of the planet. He even published a book detailing how the Martians had done this to keep their society hydrated. These days, though, the Martian canals are recognized as nothing but random lines on the surface of the red planet. Animal magnetism You've likely heard the term animal magnetism before, but did you know that the term is the name for a magnetized liquid that was discovered in the 18th century by an eccentric inventor? In the 1770s, France was suffering from a food shortage and a financial crisis, so Marie Antoinette told them all to eat cake. Not really, but you get the idea. It was the end of the era of enlightenment, but it wasn't quite over yet. People were still obsessed with fortune tellers, spiritualists, and astrologers. And one of the scientific minds who flourished in this environment was German physician Franz Anton Mesmer. He'd gotten into some serious trouble in Vienna after failing to cure a blind pianist, then seducing her. So he traveled to Paris in 1778 and developed the idea of animal magnetism. It was his grand theory and it was a doozy. Mesmer claimed that a unique fluid pervaded the entire universe, uniting and connecting all living beings. It was a blatant ripoff of ether, to be completely honest, but with a spiritual twist. Mesmer argued that animal magnetism was responsible for the ailments in the human body. Any blockage in a person's magnetic flow could cause them to come down with a disease or a sickness. They could become psychologically damaged or even become mentally insane. And the only way to cure such an ailment was to remedy the magnetic imbalance. But how does one do that? In order to heal your magnetic flow, you need a certified animal magnetism therapist. Mesmer often saw patients himself. 
He would locate the magnetic poles on someone's body thanks to his own unusually strong magnetism. He would then touch and massage people while staring deeply into their eyes until the magnetism was properly balanced. It's important to note that most of his patients were beautiful women. And Mesmer was a notorious quack and womanizer. Scientists tried to disprove his theory from the very start, but it was hard. A lot of the patients who saw Mesmer claimed they were healed afterward. People were thrown into fits, flailing and moaning as they believed their animal magnetism levels were brought back to normal. Benjamin Franklin famously dismissed Mesmer as a lunatic, but it didn't stop animal magnetism from taking over Europe until the 1850s. These days, people still believe in the idea of magical forces in the body having an effect on health. But as far as scientists are concerned, animal magnetism never existed at all. Do you believe in animal magnetism or something similar that exists in the body? Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Ice mask. What the heck is this woman wearing? It might seem like she donned the mask in order to become Ice Woman, the great mask crusader, but it actually ended up being used for a far more down to earth purpose curing hangovers. People have been trying to figure out a cure for hangovers for ages, or at least try to hide it. When this freaky ice mask was invented in 1947 by makeup magnet Max Factor, it was originally intended to be used by actresses in between takes in order to keep their faces cool down from the hot lighting used on set. That actually doesn't sound bad at all, right? I could use that on a hot summer's day too. However, it appears that the hard partying Hollywood elite figured out that it could be used as a hangover cure. Essentially an ice tray, the plastic squares in the mask were filled with water and frozen until needed, either on set or the morning after a party. It doesn't look too photogenic, but partygoers definitely put this mask to good use. Now, these types of masks are extremely popular, although they are more subtle but still unattractive. Don't think you should wear them around or anything, but they promise to enhance your skin's natural defense barrier with essential probiotics and electrolytes for a brighter, more revived complexion. Max Factor was ahead of its time. Metal Ring with Spikes So take a wild guess at what this is for. Looks kind of grotesque, right? Like some sort of torture device or inappropriate item from medieval times? While you can hold this like a pair of scissors, it doesn't look like this contraption can be used to cut paper. But those spikes are definitely used to some strange end. Could it have been a medical device? Or could it even have a more nefarious purpose? Reddit user CleverClem found this mechanism underneath the floor of a home built at the beginning of the 1800s. When he took to the internet to find out what exactly this eerie object might have been used for, he was stumped. The thread, what is this thing, came to the rescue. And it turns out that the answer is far less unsavory than it might seem at first. Actually, if you like hard-boiled eggs, it might be exactly to your taste. This device was used to help peel the shells off of hard-boiled eggs. Or soft-boiled, up to you. Nowadays, you can find many devices on the market that have a similar use, but none as unusual as this one. What did you think that this device was used for? Let me know in the comments below. Suspicious Instrument At first glance, this looks kind of like an old hammer, but the claw at its end puts all of those theories to bed. How are you supposed to hold it? What was this thing meant to do? As it turns out, this device was referred to as a dental key, and it was used in dentistry practices throughout the 1900s in order to remove damaged and diseased teeth. While it may seem barbaric given our current practices, pulling teeth was preferred to other forms of dental surgery in those days because of the lack of antibiotics. If something was wrong with your tooth, it was much better to just take it out. But this thing was not all positives. J.M. Henson Jr. from the College of Dental Surgery writes of this dangerous and barbarous instrument, saying that it led to more injuries than all other tools used for pulling teeth combined. Instead of extracting the tooth easily, it would just crush it or twist it around, making it more prone to infection. Meant to look like a door key, it was inserted horizontally into the mouth and fastened around the tooth which the dentist would then rotate to extract. Worst case scenario, this often caused the tooth to break, leading to jaw injuries and tissue damage. I certainly would not want to be on the other end of this gadget. Just thinking about it gives me the heebie-jeebies. And now for number seven, but first it's shout out time. Want to give a big thank you to Paola Gutierrez and Avinash Monelial for supporting this channel. Thanks guys. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and join us. The Cyclomer. Don't worry, this one isn't medical. This one is less creepy. It actually seemed kind of fun. It was some sort of bicycle. But other than that, it could be anyone's guess. 
What are all the balls? Is the material around the wheels some kind of protective barrier? But then, why is it in so many places on the bike? As it turns out, this bike was the world's first two-wheeler meant for both the land and the sea. Want to ride your bike, but also want to keep riding in the water? Then this contraption is for you. That's right, this thing could pedal on both the road and in the water. Invented in Paris in the early 30s, the wheels are actually hollowed out floats, as are the four floats on the top. What's more, the bike could haul up to an additional 120 pounds. Sadly, this bike phased out of use because it couldn't garner much speed in either of its intended domains. I mean, it looks kind of heavy. However, other seafaring bikes have taken over in the Cyclomer's stead since its departure. So if you like the idea of riding your bike, but don't want to have to change your pace as you approach the lake, then the Cyclomer and its descendants are right up your alley. Looks fun to me. Pointy headgear. Wow, what is this strange experiment in headgear? Even if some of these items were useful, it's hard to deny that this does not look like something you should be wearing anywhere. You might stab something or take someone out without even noticing. Although now that I think of it, it might help you keep that six feet of social distance. While the other objects I told you about have some purpose, this cone-esque mask looks instead like something straight out of a science fiction movie. It is difficult to figure out what the purpose of this piece of headgear could have been. Here's a hint. It's a Canadian invention. Do you have any guesses? As it turns out, the Canadians probably had a good use for it given how chilly it can get for them. This plastic mask was invented in order to protect your face from the cold during intense snowstorms. There isn't much more information than that available to us. The only record of its existence comes from the Netherlands National Archives Bibliographic Record, which states only the following. Plastic face protection from snowstorms, Canada, Montreal, 1939. In Dutch, they call these things plastic snoofstorm beschirmer. Talk about a mouthful. At any rate, it doesn't seem like these things caught on. Clearly, they didn't become very fashionable or popular. I think scarves and hats are the preferred way to stay warm in the winter, but who knows? Maybe fashion will come back around to the snoofstorm beschirmer. Mustache shield. Now, who doesn't want one of these? Oh, wait. I don't think there's a high demand for this. It looks somewhat like a slingshot, but it's actually meant for people with old, timey, long facial hair. This strange invention is the mustache shield, created by West Virginian Virgil A. Gates in 1876. While strange to look at, it was meant to help people with ample facial hair keep themselves clean while eating and drinking. What do you think? Would you use it? Do you think this would do well on Shark Tank nowadays? Oddly enough, the mustache shield didn't come in cloth alone. Virgil writes that this shield could be constructed from rubber, metal, or any other suitable material of proper size to fit over the upper lip and mustache. It's hard to imagine someone walking around with a metal guard over their mustache, but perhaps there are some out there for whom only metal can do the job. In any case, this invention led to some descendants as well. So if you're in the market for some mustache protection, you're covered. Pocket Sundial This item is confoundingly simple in virtue of its intricacy. This thing looks like something that you might see in a magician's toolbox, but there is only scientific magic to speak of here. And when another Redditor went online to ask for some guidance, she was equally stumped though. Any guesses of what it is? As it turns out, this implement is a pocket sundial, or more specifically, a universal equinoctial sun ring dial, which can tell the time according to the position of the sun in the sky. While not as advanced as a watch, this thing is super dependable. At only three inches across, there are no batteries to speak of, and it's hard to imagine it breaking anytime soon. Even though this is a historical item, you can get one of your own for around $55. With it, you can accurately tell time from anywhere in the world. However, if you want to see the original, you will have to go to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Camera Pigeons now this might be obvious to some of you that this is some sort of camera, but why would there need to be that adhesive velcro-like material on top? That's because these items were fitted to pigeons. Looks a little heavy for this tiny bird to carry, no? Pigeon photography is an inventive photographic technique in its own right. Invented by Julius Neubronner in 1907, this method of gathering information was tested during World War I to great success. They would use homing pigeons, which is a pigeon domesticated and trained to deliver messages to take pictures, like an early version of drones. The pigeon is fitted with an aluminum harness onto which the camera is attached. As it turns out, pigeons are pretty reliable photographers. In fact, the hardest hurdle to jump over for Neubronner was the construction of the tiny and light-fitted camera with its attached timer. Of course, training the birds could be difficult and there are not many ways to control their location. However, 
These pigeons were effective little spies during the Great Wars of the early 20th century. Even the CIA later made such a camera for espionage pigeon photography. Now that's under the radar spying. The Everlasting Pill This object is a bit more easily identifiable, but its actual purpose is quite surprising. Clearly, this is some kind of pill or capsule, but it doesn't look like it was made using any contemporary pill coating material. That is because this pill was made from metallic antimony, which is a base metallic element. Why make a pill out of metal? Well, many people thought that antimony had effective bodily cleansing properties. Furthermore, the pill's creators intended it to be reusable, which is the reason that this ended up being referred to as the everlasting pill. But why make a pill that is reusable? At this point, things get a little bit awkward, so buckle up. The everlasting pill was not digested when taken, and it thus left the body just as it entered. Therefore, people could procure a single everlasting pill and share it with the whole family. Many people even pass this pill onto their children and grandchildren. While economical, it is perhaps not the cleanest of items here. Even though the everlasting pill was popular in the 1800s, it should be clear why it went out of fashion. Zhang Heng's Seismoscope This beautiful sculpture is actually history's first earthquake detector or seismoscope. If you already knew what it was, then kudos! Hopefully you saw it in one of my other videos. If not, be sure to check out ancient artifacts ahead of their time after you finish this one. It was invented in 132 AD by royal astronomer and mathematician Zhang Heng and was presented to the court of the Han Dynasty. The seismoscope was six feet in diameter, made out of solid bronze, and embellished with eight dragons along its sides and toads underneath making a rudimentary compass. Here's how it worked. When there was an earthquake, one of the dragons on this gourd-like object would eject a ball into one of the underlying toad's mouths, which in turn indicated the direction of the faraway quake. That way, it could provide government officials with a direction to send aid before a messenger arrived to let everyone know. They could just meet help on the road as it was on the way. It was believed to be highly accurate and could detect earthquakes from very far away, around 400 kilometers. In 2005, a group of seismologists and archaeologists at the Chinese Academy of Sciences created a functioning replica. It contained a pendulum that was suspended above a ball perched on a thin pedestal. When the pendulum swung, it would nudge the ball into one of the eight channels and trigger a system that animated the external dragon's mouth. No one knows whether this is how Heng's model worked or not. Its insides remain a mystery. Thanks for watching! Which one was your favorite? Do you have any old objects hanging out in the attic that you find mysterious? Let me know in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!